Yo, what's up? Welcome back to Weekly Roundup. My name is Frankie. We have Frankie and Rand in the house. Yo, yo, check, check. <laughs> one, two, one, two. How's everyone doing, guys? Yeah. How are you, Frankie? Yeah, good, good. Welcome back to the show. Thank uh, you, thank you. Yeah, as always, special thanks to The Coffee Break who helped us to compile all the weekly juicy news and bring it to you guys. Remember to subscribe to stay informed and be smarter in three minutes. Okay, we're coming to end of the year already. And next year by January, everyone is going to be one year older, right? And for those who are 54 years old, I think next year will be a happy year for them. But then the question would be, do they have enough money to withdraw from EVF and then retire happily, you know? We have spoke about this, like what is the sort of comfortable amount or the amount to retire? And I think what we, I recall correctly, I was closer to one to two million. You, you had in mind about 10, about 10 correct, million. Correct. Is that right? Correct. Right. But this is going to be a dream, right? So according to our Deputy Finance Minister, Stephen Sim, right, there are about 274,000 EPF members who are at the age of 54. So these people are going to withdraw their money next year. But these 274,000 people, not every one of them is going to take out a lot of money. This is because a big chunk of them, right, 35% of this group of people, they have less than 10,000 ringgit in their EPF account. 35%, you know. So 35% of 274,000 is about 70 over 1,000, close to 80,000 EPF members. They don't have more than 10,000 ringgit. That's no, that's no way. I mean, you work so hard and then, uh, what, what, what do you mean? That's, cra- that's crazy. <laughs> they have no savings and chances are they have been withdrawing from their account too and all that. So oh, yeah, so they missed the chance to accumulate their interest, their dividend over the years. Dude, that is bizarre, man. Like imagine going old and then you have you want to retire, that means you have to work some more. La. Correct. So for this group of people, chances are, you know, when they retire, they still need to find a job. Then they can yeah, work. Yeah, 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 correct. But I don't think it's all gloomy. La. For some of these are who are about to retire, right? I think like the Stephen Seam also then reported that about 8% of them have between 10 to 20,000. 13% then have 20 to 50,000. Okay. Right? 12 have 50 to 100,000, right? And Another range is about 13% of these members who are about to retire have that amount of uh, money, about 100 to 200,000. Okay, so the middle range people are sort of more equally distributed. So about 11 to 13% of the members, they have around... uh, Have have some sort of money. Correct, between 20,000 to 200,000. But that's definitely not enough until the end of your life, right? I mean, according to EPF, um, this was like last year's report, right? They said that to retire in major cities, and that is based on 2,450 ringgit per month of expenses. Not enough. And you live until 80, lah, right? Probably live until 80 and there's no inflation, lah. so you're 55 mm. to 80, right? 50 years old, no inflation, 2,004 every month. Impossible. You need a <laughs> I, think, I think the more realistic amount would be 1 million ringgit. Because if you think about it, EPF typically pays out around 6% dividend, right? Mm. So if you have mm. 1 million in your account, 6% works out to be around 60,000. 60, so 60,000 a month is okay. It's yeah. okay. If yeah. you don't spend lavishly, you know. And you just, just put it inside, you don't even withdraw, you just leave correct. it inside. Correct, correct. At about 5-6%, uh, let's say 6% on uh, mm. a good year. But 2% of these members do have that luxury. So 2% of this, like 4,800 of these members can retire comfortably. Uh, but that is such a... Only 4,000 people. That is, that is such a saddening step, dude. And, <laughs> and these are the guys who have like worked all their lives. So imagine the younger generation, like, because it's, it's something to do with compounding, right? The last two years, the withdrawals, while it was necessary for some people, it, I think it really like hampered, like really the dice, like, I mm. mean, like their retirement goals. Yeah, man. It's, it's sad, like, it's sad. We hope you guys don't have to go through that. We hope you guys are more prudent in your savings. Do keep in your EPF, find any other ways to save and keep money and then you can retire comfortably. But I think one of the ways to mitigate this risk of not having enough money to retire is really to invest your money at the early stage of your life. Yeah. yeah because yeah. of that compounding effect. So towards your retirement age, you're able to cash out quite a lump sum of money over there. Right, so speaking about investment, right? I want to talk a little bit about stock market a bit. Because, of course. <laughs> yeah, because recently I noticed this one stock, right? In the past one year, they were not doing very well, right? Mm. They were not doing very well. Mm. But suddenly, this one month or two, they were in the in, in the limelight on the news. Wow, right? okay. This nice. company is Farm Fresh. And I think many of you are investors of Farm Fresh, right? Because Peter is one of the advocates who always talk about Farm Fresh. No way, I mean, I'm a customer. Yo, I'm I a customer think, as think, well. I think, I think My fridge always has uh, farm fresh milk. Anyway, let me just go through their numbers first because uh, we just uh, finished the earnings season in Malaysia. So Farm Fresh recorded their second quarter earnings and their net profit rose to 12.8 million ringgit from 11.2 million compared to last year. Quite a respectful increment over there. 
right? And this is thanks to lower input costs, which means to say inflation is really coming down. That's one way to put it, yeah. That's quite true. The other reason is also because you remember they increased their price recently. It is more, more expensive now. It so. is more expensive. Anyway, that is not the main reason why the share price is going up. I think investors are also excited because FarmFresh made another new investment. Again. Again. Remember the last time they bought Inside Scoop? I think we talked about it on our show before about this Inside Scoop investment. But I think one ice cream brand is not enough for them. They decided to buy another ice cream outfit. What what, what kind of ice cream outfit is this? Ice cream potong. Ice cream potong. But that is such a different one from Inside Scoop. I thought they would probably acquire another, you know, similar type. That came to my mind, right? If you buy an ice cream potong business, why can't you just ask Inside Scoop to make ice cream potong? Is it true, ah? So apparently, they want more than just ice cream potong. Because this company, right, called Sinwa Ice Cream St. Jean Berhad, apart from making ice cream, they also have 6,000 distribution drop points and logistic capabilities. So it's some synergy. La. It's There's more like a synergistic uh, acquisition. Yeah. yeah, because Farm Fresh, how they distribute their products is that they rely on agents. So agents would take bulk from Farm Fresh and then they distribute it to their friends and family and whatnot. So um, in terms of distribution, maybe they are lacking over there, but by acquiring this company, Sinwa, immediately they gain these 6,000 distribution drop points and they get all the logistic capabilities, all the refrigerated coal trucks and whatnot. So I think that is the main reason why they want to acquire this company. Oh, they're but quite, quite well to do also. Uh, they're acquiring a big chunk, about 70% at 28 million. That would value the company at 40.6 million. Selling ice cream. Uh. Just ice cream. What are we doing here? Should, we should start selling ice cream. <laughs> right, right. So we buy ice cream, 50 cent, one ice cream potong. People buy ice cream potong, 40.6. Oh, wow. uh, that's the difference, bro. So now Farm Fresh got two ice cream brands already, man. Right, Inside Scoop and Ice Cream Potong, Sinwa Ice Cream. I think there's one more synergies over there because if you look at it, right, Inside Scoop, they are strong in retail business. So yep. they open shop, they sell ice cream to you, you buy, you eat on the spot. Sinwa, they sell Ice Cream Potong. So they package it, distribute it to rural areas, to all the Kedai mm. region and all that. Mm. So when you piece these two together, right, then immediately you can utilize Sinwa's distribution's capability to ask Inside Scope to develop their consumer packaged goods. Which means to say they can now pack in tubs, they can pack in, I don't know, tube or whatever, and then they rely on Sinwa to help them to distribute. That is quite a game changer, man. Uh, and then they can also ask Inside Scope to introduce ice cream, ice cream potong also, la, maybe, la, I don't know, right? But however I see it, I think this is a very good move because I think it completes the picture of Farm Fresh going into the ice cream business and all this ice cream, they're going to utilize a lot of raw materials from Farm Fresh, which is milk, dairy products, and that's going to help in terms of their profitability in the future. And this is just, we are talking about Malaysia business. They are also making forays into the Philippines. And I think if they are successful to push the brand in the Philippines, that is a new market that they can tap into. From a milk, producer to become an ice cream maker and, and whatnot. Yeah. But it makes sense like, to acquire your downstreams, right? In a way. Correct. Because correct. you're supplying to them anyway, right? Correct. And you, you know, diversify your risk your away call. because you don't just rely on milk. If something happened to your cows, you know, then your profit will be affected. Well, there's some good news for um, SMEs. I think people are also having a hard time hiring talents, right? Because the wage is not catching up in some ways. Yeah, so always the, gaji tak cukup. Correct. And it's also SM, it's, it's a very common SME struggle. You want to get talent, but you can't really afford to pay for the talent. And the talents will then go to other countries, going mm. to a neighboring country, for example, or going to a bigger company, for example. Mm. So there's always this gap in SMEs. But the government has come up with what you call a progressive white paper. Uh, it has been released and they're committed to help about 1,000 companies starting next year, June to September next year. So what they'll do, I think, is they'll roll out a pilot program and then it will help about 4 million workers in the formal sectors. So it's only meant for SMEs, mm -hmm. right? So what happened is that the pilot project is only targeting those that earn right below 5,000 ringgit, which is 4,999, mm -hmm. right? So what will happen is that the employees will be covered uh, and they will be categorized under the entry levels and non-entry levels. So the entry level folks, right, they will be eligible to get about 200 additional. Okay, the so companies have to apply for it. Right. But before we go into that, entry levels are people like the junior executives, that kind yes. of people, right? Yes. So as I was saying, right, so the entry level guys will get about 200. So what the company have to do is the company have to register and tell the government, hey, I want this incentive for my staff, right? So then to, for me to get more staff like, in a way, right? So mm. the government will then say, okay, what kind of entry stuff, right? what kind of staff do you have and how much will you be eligible for? The government will then reimburse every quarterly right, to these companies. 
how much. So let's say you have one entry level staff that you want 200. Yeah, okay. It means you, you can save your operating cost about 2004 a year. Okay, so if I want to hire five more entry level staff, so the government is going to give me an incentive of 1,000 ringgit, yeah. right? And then I'm supposed to disperse this 1,000 ringgit back to the five new workers. Correct. Right. So yeah, then, then you're not entry. So be more senior folks, you'll get about 300 ringgit. Mm. Also for a period of 12 months, because they are just testing it out. Want to see what is the reception of the economy, of the companies. Will this really then drive the agenda to like raise the average wage of Malaysians? So right now we have a minimum wage of 1,005 ma, yep. per person. Yep. So with this add-on incentive of 200, so does that mean that they are going to get 1,007? So not, not necessarily 200 ringgit, but up to 200 ringgit. So it really depends on how I suppose the company justify or how the government then allocate this money. La. Speaking of justification, I don't think the government is, is just going to give you the money like that. I think, I think they need to see some progress because this is called a progressive yeah, wage yeah, policy, yeah. right? So I'm sure the government would want all this stuff, all this new stuff to go through some sort of training, skill upgrading and all that. But it should, it should, it should, should, la, right? it should because not, otherwise you're paying then or oh, it's sort of gaming the system, right? Correct. You cannot just increase your wage but your productivity is the same. Then you're actually paying a very expensive staff to do a very low level job. Um, they should also be incentivized to upskill. I think, let's see, let's see how it pans out. Uh, but of course, there are also cases where some companies tend to be a bit funny. La. <laughs> let's hope that doesn't happen. As, as with any subsidies, people will tend to take advantage of it. But mm. it will also help people. Let's see, let's see how it pans out. I think it's a good move for the government. So that's not just the only initiative that the government is doing. So remember during KJ's time when he was the health minister, he, yep. he presented the GEG bill, yep. the generational endgame bill. But sadly, with the new government, they decided to remove that element from the public health bill. Meaning to say like, those that are born after 2007 can never buy a cigarette. Never. Can never buy a vape also. I think vape was... Any tobacco products. Any, any tobacco or nicotine product, I think they were not. Any tobacco actually, not nicotine. Any tobacco product they were not to buy. So, yeah. But that has been dropped. Lah. Looks like they can why, buy now. Why, why is that the case? Uh, because there were news saying that, you know, it was unconstitutional. That was the word that was being used, lah, right? Uh, right? That one is copying from what New Zealand say, lah, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because New Zealand did the same thing. They removed the GEG in their country. But the argument here is that they didn't remove it because it is unconstitutional. Mm. It's just because there's a change in government in New Zealand. And apparently oh, yeah. the new okay. government is more pro towards human rights. And they think that it's your right to think for yourself whether you want to smoke or not. So I give you the option. Oh, is so it therefore, more... So therefore, they removed the bill. Is it more pro-business? Definitely, it's more pro-business <laughs> because if you make it legal, the government can collect tax. And I think, I think, this is my own personal opinion, that's the main reason why our government is doing it as well. Because if you do generational endgame and if you are born after 2007 and you want to smoke, you have the urge. What do you do? Illicit secret. Yeah, number one. No more taxes, oh? no, no more taxes. No, like, no, no more taxes, like government don't get the tax. La. And number two, you create a lot of uh, social issues, right? Social mm. issues, you have all the illegal stuff, you have all the gangsters and stuff like Which that. Which actually right? have to spend money and curb it. La. Actually, la, actually, there's a cost to you one. Hidden cost, actually, people don't know, right? Because you have to then get your police force or your border patrol force or whatever to then right. curb this. And then, if you don't allow people to buy a cigarette, means there's no more tobacco industry in Malaysia. You won't have job opportunities. You mm. won't have mm. all these factories. You won't have investments. Mm. You lose out a lot. So I think taking into account all this consideration, right? Maybe that's the reason why the government want to remove that element. Mm, I think it's fair because it's always a feel good thing, right? To then not allow people to smoke. So after this element is being removed, then how does this new revised public health bill different from the past? I mean, I think it's relatively similar, la, but now it just says fines are heftier. Okay. Right? I think the fines are heftier. It's supposed to be more strict like, because the and the enforcement officers now will be given a body cam. Oh, okay. To then see like who is uh, who is then buying cigarettes. Under age under 18 not supposed to buy la. But the enforcement officer cannot be every day, hey you go buy or not, you go buy or not. Eh? Cannot cannot be like that, man. And especially around school areas, right? Because school areas is where mm. this happens but my my high school in front we had a mama. Mm. And people would buy cigarettes. And they would sell cigarettes, right? So it, it, it's are they are they gonna wear body cams? So again, uh, it comes down to implementation. Uh. Yeah. Same problem with Subsidy rationalization, I think it's going to be the same for this uh, GEG as well. Yeah, but Malaysians are in support of GEG. I mean, at least about 30% of Malaysians are because GEG receive about 9.2 million signatories. So of course, because it is politically popular. Uh, as all 
politicians do. La. They are smart in playing these kind of games, mm. right? Do you agree with GEG or do you not agree with GEG? Let us know in the comments below. Another development is going to happen in Johor. This time it's the LRT. Malaysian's favourite. Eh, I thought they already have the thing. Yes, but RTS is between uh, Singapore JB and JB. And, ma. Yeah. But okay. now they want to have sort of like, I assume some sort of last mile connection la, right, in, in Johor. Johor has identified three LRT lines mm. within Johor Bahru and it's going to cover about 30 km. And the three lines are the Febrau line, the Skudai line and the Iskandar Putri line which will extend to the Senai airport. Good yeah. uh. So I, I think it's good in the sense that it provides the last mile connectivity like, like I said earlier. Right? So, it, so it, like, it then, your, your Singaporean who happily spending ringgit here won't just be at RTS and then be like, hey, where should I go next? Mm. Having LRT sort of helps them to you know, drive into certain areas that maybe not covered before. Yeah. You have, you, to get around Johor, maybe you need a car. Mm. Right? Or you, you know, no one's going to rent a car, you take a grab. But now you have an LRT, then there'll be um, what you call spillover effects. Ah. Yeah. Learning from experience, if you look back Klang Valley, mm. our first LRT line was Kalana Jaya line. Yep. And then subsequently, we have the Star Line, mm. we have Monorail, yep. then we have MRT Line 1, Line 2, now we are talking about Line 3. Right? And because of that infrastructure development, Klang Valley is what it is today. Correct. Right? Correct. And then Penang, they are also talking about building their own LRT system. Right, but of course, Penang is already a developed state. So I think the LRT system is really to ease the traffic over there. Yep. But I think Johor, if they are going into all this infrastructure development, I think they are going to follow the path that the Klang Valley had experienced before. Like a, like a boom. Like, like a, a boom. boom la. And, and it's, it's rightful in the sense that, you see, uh, so my girlfriend's parents are from Laka and, okay. and they, are, they are taxpayers. Like all Malaysians, around Malaysia, wherever, Kelantan, Terengganu, and Kedah. But there are no infrastructure projects there. Or not as many, not as many big ones. Mm. So sometimes they come to KL and say, hey, yeah, so lucky, uh, your, your KL folks, uh, you all get MRT, you all get LRT. We pay one. Ah, <laughs> we, we pay, you know, because, they, because they are tax payers, they, are tax payers, right? we, they, they pay one, one, but you, you mm. KL folks get it. So it's about, it's right blah, that these kind of states they are developing, right? they should also get their own transport system. Because mm, these kind of big projects are usually funded by federal government. Federal right? government. Uh, there is no um, inkling on how much this, this would cost. But take Penang's uh, reference, for example. Penang 1, the Penang RT is uh, expected to cost about 10 billion for uh, 27 kilometer. So mm. with 30 kilo, it will probably be the same. And yeah. this is in the future somehow, right? The cost mm. may or may not go up. But um, I think this 10 billion ringgit serves as a reference only. Because mm. at the end of the day, a lot of factors go into the price. Land acquisition. Where, yeah, land acquisition, whether it is underground or overground, mm. you know, this mm. kind of stuff. How many stations you're going to build. So all this will be part of the cost. So maybe 10 billion is a good ballpark figure to start. And let's see how they're going to raise the funds to build this LRT. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can't, I can't wait. It, it's about time. Like. I really think it's about time that other states get some of these opportunities to then see what the Klang Valley folks have been enjoying. Yeah. But anyways, let's zoom out a little bit. Uh, just now I said that Malaysia just finished our own earnings season, right? Um, and one month ago, the US also completed their earnings season. And I specifically want to point out this one company's Punya uh, result because it caught my attention. NVIDIA. I bet you know NVIDIA, right? It's one of the best it's, AI company. It's on the roll this year. Yeah. Correct. So I just want to touch a little bit on their earnings, right? Um, 80% of their third quarter sales came from data center segments. And then the remaining 20% comes from gaming, professional visualization, that means graphic cards, mm. um, automotive, EV, you know, stuff like that. Right? But that's not my point of why I want to talk about NVIDIA. Oh, why? Why do you want to talk about NVIDIA? 15% on the revenue comes from one country. So now I'm not talking about the product mix. I'm talking about the geographical mix. Like total revenue of... Total revenue of one NVIDIA. country contributes 15% of their revenue. US lah. Must be US, right? Oh, because no, no. that's where it's based, right? Very small country, i give you one hint. Singapore. Huh? What? What do you mean? Correct, correct. And 15% of NVIDIA's total revenue means $2.7 billion came from Singapore. What are they doing? What are they doing in Singapore? So without without telling you more, just now I mentioned that 80% of the revenue comes from data center, mm. right? Mm. And yeah, it fits very well into the Singapore narrative. Actually, most of the revenue came from the development of data centers in Singapore. Oh, Singapore, well, but Singapore is such a small space. How do they have so many data centers? Apparently, all these MNCs, they want to uh, set up shops in Singapore. They want to make Singapore the hub of oh. ASEAN and things like that, right? But during that time, I think they were building a lot of data centers in Singapore. Until the point, the Singapore government imposed a moratorium 
to say you cannot build any more data centers in Singapore, right? And this moratorium was lifted in January 2022. After that, this wave of new data centers has been coming back. So today in Singapore, right, there are more than 70 operational data centers over there. And 70 may sound like a small number, but it actually accounts for 60% of Southeast Asia's total <laughs> data center capacity. You are giving me like, I'm, I'm... A lot of numbers, right? I'm... Let me just put into context for you. Malaysia has a lot more land than Singapore, but Singapore controls 60% of the whole Southeast Asia's <laughs> market share. How do these guys do it? Seriously. So after Singapore lifted the moratorium in uh, January 2022, mm. some of the bigger data centers that went there were Equinix, uh, wow. Microsoft, and also some Chinese data center solutions provider. Lah. And now, ByteDance, which is the parent company of TikTok, they're mm. also talking about building a data center in Singapore. Aye. So with all this new development, right, maybe next quarter NVIDIA's result will have a significant portion coming from there as well. Is it a missed opportunity for our country? <sighs> Good question. Uh, is, it miss, is it a missed opportunity for our country? Because Looks like we it, are, right? if Jo- We have a lot more land, cheaper land. I, I, I think why companies want to build data centers in uh, around this region is that because we are relatively safe, there's no earthquakes. Mm. If you think about it, right, Singapore's energy cost is a lot higher than Malaysia. But why do they still go to Singapore? It's, it must be some other reason, right? Maybe tax incentive. Possibly. La. But that gives me another thought. There's mm. a huge potential for Johor to grow into a very substantial economical zone. With the LRT. <laughs> With the LRT. <laughs> hey, I'm, the, not, hey, I'm, not, I'm not a lobbyist for LRT. I'm not working for anyone yeah. or any, any... I'm not in any of the counters, uh, by the way. Uh, just, yeah. just saying. With LRT, <laughs> with the special financial zone that PMX announced not too long ago, I think all this is preparing for all this spillover effect from Singapore to Johor and make Johor a really important economic zone in this region. Nice. I think that, that sort of wraps up for mm. this week's news. Uh, are there any other news this week? Nope. I think we kind of cover most of the things that uh, we want to talk about this week. Um, what do you think if you have any comments, if you think what we say is wrong or if you want to chip in your own opinion, feel free to the comment box. Yeah. yeah. Don't forget to subscribe uh, to the Coffee Break and you get way more news than uh, But it's all summarized, make it, easy f- make it easy for you to read and you will stay smarter. Oh yeah, and if you use the link to download, I think you will also get a summary of Malaysia IPO 2023. Ah, yes, uh, yes, yes. yes. Like how, how many companies cash out? 30, uh, 30 companies <laughs> IPO in uh, Malaysia in 2023. How did they perform? Yeah, how did they perform and things like that. And I think good job done there for Thank Kushin. you. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for your com- nice comments. <laughs> Anyways, uh, look forward to see you guys again next week. Um, I will be back. Bye-bye.